Hey everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining our event here. I'm excited to, for this chat on the art of persuasive pitching. Um, we're gonna have Olivia, Eric, and Mac, um, you know, as our featured presenters today. Really excited for that. Just gonna share a quick intro video. Um, this is through the Prepare for VC community, which I think you know all of you have joined and signed up for the event here. Um, and yeah, I'd also, you know, like to keep this engaged as well. So if you guys want to, um, yeah, introduce yourselves in the chat, feel free to share, you know, LinkedIn, um, your, your uh, yeah, LinkedIn's or other connections there as well, or even, you know, what, what you're working on with your current startups. Um, and then, yeah, and then, you know, as we go, um, we're going to start with a a presentation from Olivia, and then um, we're gonna have a panel with Mac and Eric as well from the VC side on what they look for in, um, in pitches and presentations. And again, we're gonna keep it open if anybody has uh, questions through the chat along the way, and also additional questions we can open up to like unmute and ask directly um, towards the end as well. So just going to start with a quick video here on what we're up to at Prepare for VC. And so, yeah, this is part of our, let me stop sharing here. Um, this is part of our event series. Uh, definitely check out the other events we have coming up as well. You know, interact in our community page and excited to hand it over to, um, yeah, to Olivia to kick things off here and, you know, start with the introductions on all of you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jason. Um, I'm very happy to be with you all this evening. Um, my name is Olivia Kantika, for those of you who don't know me. Um, just a brief intro and by way of background. I'm a brand strategist and innovation consultant. Um, I work with founders, thought leaders, and organizations to stay essentially one step ahead of the curve um, by building growth roadmaps, enhancing business workflows, and developing market visibility. Um, I have a specialty in persuasive communications. I actually have a law degree and a certification as a mediator. Um, so persuasive communications in both my personal and professional life have served me rather well. Uh, and within the startup community, I've worked with over 30 founders to launch clear and cohesive concepts. Um, everything from early stage on uh, all the way through uh, launching Series A funding. So I'm very excited to have you all this evening. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it to uh, Eric and uh, Mac as well for intros. You want me to go, Olivia? Yes, please. Um, okay, Eric Bolin. Uh, I am. I do a few things. I'm an investor at uh, a couple angel groups here in Boston, the Launch Pad Venture Group, which is about 150 members, and then Walnut Ventures, which is 40 members. Also an LP and a couple of funds, including Mendoza Ventures, uh, which invests in AI and fintech. Um, I'm also a mentor at several accelerators, including Techstars, and then I also um, advise companies directly, pre-seed, seed stage, and uh, scale-ups in Boston and also overseas internationally in uh, Dubai and uh, Berlin and uh, Sydney right now. So nice to Thanks for having me. Amen. Great, thanks. I guess I'm last. Uh, McKeever Conwell, better known as Mac, if you follow me on Twitter, is Mac the VC. I'm a software engineer by trade, two-time startup CEO with one exit. Uh, used to work for the investment arm of the state of Maryland, where I started the first and only state-backed pre-seed fund for women and minorities in the country. And now um, I'm in the process of raising a $10 million fund for Rare Breed Ventures, a pre-seed to seed venture fund. 
uh, with the minimum check of 10K. We're raising in the 506C so I can publicly solicit. So every time I get a chance, I'll shout that out. Um, we specialize in everything. So we're industry agnostic. We do everything but life sciences and uh, happy to be here. Great, thank you to you both. Um, so we'll start the evening's uh, session essentially with our uh, top 10 tips. So we've collaborated on these and we'll certainly post them uh, on social media later on, um, either today or tomorrow. Um, so no need to frantically take notes, but um, essentially, um, here we go. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I don't know where everyone else is, but here on the East Coast, it's just after five o'clock, it's been a long day. So take a deep breath. You're here, you made it through. Um, but we also wanted to congratulate yourself for landing a pitch meeting. So pitch meetings and landing them first and foremost are probably 50% of the curve uphill. Um, it's not necessarily downhill from here, but we definitely wanna take the time to congratulate yourselves and um, you know, the fact that you made it this far. So the first thing that we wanted to chat about um, or are essentially worth, you know, showing your worth. Um, what are investors paying for? What's the amount of experience that they're looking for? Um, so we found in terms of showing your worth, um, demonstrating why you're worth, what you're asking for. So if you're early stage asking for 50K, if you're later on and you're asking for 5 billion, you still have to show substantial proof where that money is going for, uh, going to. So tout your background, uh, don't be shy. Um, essentially you're looking at your secret sauce. So what makes you different from others? Um, startup funding is incredibly competitive. If you go on Twitter these days, I mean, the, the market is, in, is completely saturated. So here we wanna show, you know, show your worth, don't be shy, and definitely make sure you differentiate yourself from others. Uh, language. Um, I went through law school. Um, I got my certification as a mediator. I spent a lot of money on learning these tips in terms of using the proper language, um, but in terms of using persuasive language, um, metaphors, similes, and, anal and analogies. Um, these phrases and terms will definitely uh, differentiate you from others. Um, it's going to make your pitch a little bit stronger. Um, so if you use terms like compared to, Whereas we've demonstrated our value by, unlike X, we've provided. Um, so here, instead of saying I, 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 you're actually um, putting yourself as a differentiating company amongst your industry. So forecasting, um, this gets a little tricky um, in terms of financial planning and forecasting. You never really know where your market is gonna be 100%, um, but based on your uh, research and your experience, um, we all know the, the phrase from Aladdin, um, from Disney's Aladdin, I can show you the world. Uh, so that's essentially the information that investors are looking for. So based on industry strengths, where do you think your company is gonna be in the next three to five years? Is there gonna be an uptick in the market for your product or service? And why should they invest now versus six months from now or five years from now? A lot of investors will say, you know, this is a great idea, but it, you're not quite there yet. You're not right for me now. Um, definitely, you know, look into those opportunities and say why you're relevant to your market now. So repetition, repetition, rinse and repeat. Um, this is more of a psychological cadence um, that you can set throughout your pitch. Uh, we all know that repetition helps with memory. Um, so whether it's repeating your brand story, which we all know um, from prior events that we've done, uh, brand story repetition is, incre is increasingly compelling throughout your pitch. Um, and it's especially compelling if you include a more personal note. So a customer quote, a client mentor, famous figure. So it actually brings your uh, brand story to life. And we wanna make sure that you are reiterating your value prop all throughout your pitch and ending in a strong statement. So make sure that the last slide is essentially your closing statement for your argument um, to make sure that they are left with uh, something that they'll remember for the days to come. 
So friction. Um, friction by itself is a term that has a, a pretty much of a negative connotation, um, but we like to consider this more so as uh, kind of like movie storytelling. So if you consider it when you go to a movie, there's usually a buildup. Um, there's, you know, obstacles, there's uh, gunfighting, there's uh, hills to climb, there's a lot of things that are going on, but causing that friction will actually make the solution that much more satisfying. So when you're identifying the problem and solution in your pitch, uh, we all know that those are key elements in terms of your slides, but what's the rationale behind including them? So we're driving home on the negative emotion. So create a little bit of frustration, create a little uncertainty, um, sadness, FOMO, fear of missing out, um, and then make sure you're soothing with your solution. So essentially this is your formula as an end result, you'll create an empathetic VC. Objections. Um, there will be questions, there will be holes and gaps. Uh, I most certainly can assure you that there will be curveballs also that are thrown from each VC. It's hard to prepare everything that, um, that they will ask within your pitch meeting, uh, but we would recommend in terms of addressing objections, um, if there's any uncertainty, address it during your pitch, or if you don't have the, the answer prepared, make sure you follow up accordingly. So if a VC leaves the meeting saying, I'm not sure, yeah, but it's not the right time, or I don't really think the other you know, stakeholders will, will agree with my rationale. If they leave with that thinking, you've already lost your opportunity. So make sure that you're answering any objections. And if you can't answer it at that time, make sure you follow up accordingly. So assertiveness, uh, pitching can be intimidating. Uh, I've worked with founders early stage all through series A and that nervous factor never quite goes away. It could be your first pitch or your 50th, um, but investors are essentially looking for assertive leadership qualities uh, in terms of who they're, they're bringing on. So don't be afraid to assert your position. Uh, don't use passive or wishy-washy language. So I think it looks like perhaps, uh, this is all language that I'd probably tell somebody that I didn't wanna date. You know, if they ask me out on a first date, I think I'm busy, you know, it may not be possible to schedule this for this evening. Um, instead, I would use more so affirmative language. So you should consider this is at the forefront, um, though it may seem you'd be surprised that so more affirmative language will definitely take a more authority, authoritative stance. So inclusivity, this is a technique that I use actually every, every single day with my team. So if you keep saying I, 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 it makes you seem like you're a solo shop. Uh, but when you have actually team members in the background, even though they may not be listed on your website, or it may be included in your pitch meetings. Um, there's power in the collective force that's working behind the scenes. Investors wanna see that. Um, if they're investing in you, they're investing in the people that you've hired as, as your team as well. So the collection of the minds is actually more persuasive than investing in you as a solopreneur. Uh, relatability. Uh, we all know Wally. Um, clearly, I like my Disney references, um, but we're all human at the end of the day. So no matter our roles or titles, whether you're, you know, a founder who is working full time uh, and and starting a gig on the side, or if you're a VC um, who has a million followers on Twitter, um, at the end of the day, we're all human. So there is a likability factor that VCs are looking for. Um, they want somebody who could be mentored somebody that's coachable, somebody that they actually wanna work with and have a regular conversation with. Um, at the end of the day, it's somebody that they not necessarily have drinks with, but somebody that they would consider qualified as a, as a business partner. And the last one is something that uh, you usually see when you go to movies, uh, silence is golden. Um, I also like to compare it to website design. 
Um, if you have too many words and graphics uh, with jumbled up thoughts on the website, usually your ideas and your value prop doesn't have enough room to breathe. So make sure you set a natural cadence to your presentation. Take pause, uh, pause moments uh, with open-ended questions, uh, transitional sentences as well. And, re and remember that you, know, you don't need to rush. I know that usually you have X amount of time to go through pitches, but uh, this is your time to shine. Uh, it's your time to set the stage. Um, it's your time to prove your value and your dominance. Uh, and you want to make sure you maximize that time as well. So I wanted to open up with a couple of questions for our VCs. Let's see. All right, hopefully that stops sharing my screen. All right, so if Eric and Mac can uh, unmute. Um, so I wanted to throw a, you know, a little bit of a curveball in the beginning. Let's talk about likability. So what are some of the personal qualities that you're looking for when a founder is pitching? Um, what qualities make you more compelled to say, you know what, I like this person. You know, this might be, this might be something that I'm interested in. Um, yeah, love you. Oh, Mac, you want to go ahead? No, go ahead, Eric. It's all you. Okay. Um, so a big thing for me is coachability, right? And I, I think a, a few things that he threw out there in terms of assertiveness and uh, leaving white space or, or so on, I, I think that kind of tie into that as well. But as a founder is pitching uh, and then uh, listening and uh, taking in questions, uh, we really look for signals whether that uh, founders listening to what uh, the advice or guidance or the questions are that are given, right? And then how can the founder adjust accordingly? And how is the founder actually responding to it? Uh, and sometimes you have founders who are very, uh, th there's one thing about be having conviction about it, right? But at the same time saying, hey, you know what? If you don't know something, say so, right? It's okay to say, you know what? A good question. I don't know. Let me get back to you, right? As opposed to trying to get over it. Uh, and, and try to get to the next question and, and act like you know the answer, right? So um, again, I, I think it's good to be assertive. It's good to have a conviction, but if you don't know, know something, say so. Um, also, sometimes you see founders multiple times, right? And um, the VCs or angels give feedback in terms of the pitch and the positioning and the direction, or maybe the gaps in the pitch. And when they come back, you know, you better have it, you better have evolved, right? And, and improved your pitch at that point. And sometimes we do, you know, most of the time, if they're coachable founders and they have a learning mindset, they do that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we have founders who didn't adjust a single thing, right? And that's not a good sign in terms of even how they run the business. Mac, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would, I agree with Eric on all accounts. What I would say is, your passion comes through in the pitch, right? And granted, that should not be a thing that uh, investors lean heavily <clears> on, but I will tell you, it will sway folks, right? Like people will get excited by your excitement. Um, so keep that in mind. The other thing is um, to add, one thing I look for is the way, if you're pitching and you have your co-founders with you, I look to see the way you interact with your co-founders. I look to see if you talk over each other. I look to see if you argue about things. I look to see if you contradict each other. Because that's a sign of how you work as a team. And, you know, if you're not working cohesively as a team, that's already a negative indicator. That's also going to be a sign of how you're going to work with me, right? This is how you work in general. So I'm always looking for the little things also when you're pitching. Um, but Eric hit on all the other key parts. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it, maybe one other thing, and I think Mac, you, you kind of alluded to this too, is, is what's the personal, what's the backstory here, right? Why are you as a founding team doing this? And that's really important for me. Um, you know, it, it's not about the money usually. Or it, it shouldn't be about the money, right? There, there's usually some kind of backstory and why the founder thinks that, uh, you know, I am the one to solve this particular problem. I know it's there. I'm the one to solve it, right? And I, I want to know why. And what that tells me is if, if you do have some reason to do this other than money, that if things become difficult, uh, right, as they always do during startups, you'll stick with it and you'll figure out a way to do it. Hmm. And as opposed to giving up. And it's just, a, it's not a shiny, bright, shiny object and you'll go on to the next one if things become difficult. 100%. Yeah, it's interesting that you guys touch on the why statement because um, I've heard the struggles amongst founders, you know, those that have a why of financial gain um, are in 
pretty much for a rough road, right? Unless they, you know, reach their milestones within the first year or so. Um, but otherwise, you know, what is your why? Are you, um, are you setting the stage for as a groundbreaking leader in your industry? Are you uh, providing for your family? Are, do you really want to be an expert in X, Y, and Z? So that in itself will help you sleep better at night. Uh, because if it's just the money, um, you're definitely, you're, you're in for a lot of sleepless nights. <laughs> Yeah, Olivia, one other thing, just as you're touching on money, right? I think the other thing that, that we're looking for is, um, you know, raising money, that's not the goal, right? The goal is it's a tool for you to build a healthy business and a healthy company, a long-term sustainable company. That, that's what you need to be focused on. You know, what I, you know, one of my pet peeves is when there's a celebration around closing around and, and funding and so on. Right? Great, right? right celebrate that but ultimately what you should be celebrating is revenue and customers right focus on that 100 mm. percent. and you know to, to all these points the reason why it's important for you to be you're solving a problem that you're truly passionate about like when we talk about getting when this this process gets hard let's be honest about it it gets really hard like there are going to be dark days there are going to be days where this is not going to be fun where you're going to be struggling and it's going to be what's going to keep you going when it gets really hard, if this isn't something you truly care about, you're truly passionate about, are you going to stick with it? Like we look for that. And that's part of the passion that we look for when you pitch. Because we want to see if this is something you're truly passionate about, it's going to come out. Like when you start to talk about this problem, we're going to notice that. Right. And those are other things that we look for in a pitch. Hmm. What about um, raising objections, right? VCs have different ways of raising objections. You can either do it throughout the pitch, right? And kind of, you know, this, this interruption cadence, or you can do it in, uh, in an email afterwards or at the end of the pitch. How do you typically like to uh, approach a founder with your, your outstanding questions? Yeah, so for me, I'm typically going to ask you questions throughout your pitch, right? Like, because there, there are specific questions I'm trying to get to. And I'll also say this, right? When you first meet me for the first time, I'd rather have a conversation than a full pitch. And that's just unique to us in our firm, right? So when you meet me or when you meet somebody else on our team, the first meeting is typically a conversation. You can have a deck if you want, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking to have a conversation and get some key indicators from you. And then the second meeting is where we have the pitch. And even then we're going to stop you throughout and start the digging on the partners that we care the most about because sometimes founders will it will use their deck as a crush to get through all the things that they want to get through. But I don't need to hear everything that you want to tell me. There are specific things that I want to hear for me to help make my evaluation. But that's how we work at Rare Breed and every fund is different. Yeah, and, and as Max said, I think every fund is different and every investor might approach things differently in terms of the form or the cadence or, or the way that the meetings are structured. Uh, just give you some insight in terms of how do you things, both at Launchpad and Walnut in general, the approach is similar. Uh, we have uh, we take a look at three to four companies a month, and uh, each a company gets 20 minutes to pitch. And then there's five minutes of Q and A, and then subsequent to that, there's five minutes of internal member deliberation whether we want to take that company to the next stage. So at that point, uh, the company pitches for 20 minutes, and then we have Q and A afterwards. Uh, if that company moves forward, and let's say at Launchpad where we do price seed rounds, the next stage is what we call the deep dive, and that's where we take another hour, hour and a half with the CEO and the co-founder to dive deeper into the business. And that's where we might ha have them pitch and, and might stop and dig deeper into the business. So it's not, not, not a clear clear sequence in terms of that, that, that previous pitch. Um, if they do pass that deep dive, then we go into due diligence and we separate that into business and then technology due diligence. And that's much deeper as well. And again, the form is slightly different there. And we'll, we'll dig deep into the business there uh, with the founders as well as the employees and potentially some reference customers. And I know that both of you have a wealth of experience in terms of being on the side of, of listening, right? Listening when a founder comes in. But what typically are kind of like red flags or leaves you thinking, yeah, but you know, this isn't quite right for me. You know, what are some of those things that you're thinking about that cause moments of hesitation and actually saying yes? I was going to let Eric. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, so, so a few things, right? I think there's, um, you always look at uh, from a purely investor perspective, hey, you know, I'm looking at, let's say 20 companies this week, right? 
of those 20 companies, or let's say once of the 12 months, and I'm drawing general, not just my personal perspective, but let's say you look at angel investors, right? Maybe on average, an angel investor does uh, between five and, and six to seven investments a year, right? So the odds are, are pretty low for you as a founder. So you've got to look at the odds as well. And then for me as an investor, why am I giving you that money versus the other 20 companies that I saw this this week, right? So it is a numbers game. <clears throat> and for me personally, I need to believe, okay, first of all, what's the probability of you succeeding as a founder in this particular market? Um, what's the potential of this company, uh, including the, the size and the potential exit? And, and then at the same time, what's the period here that, that I'm looking for a return, right? And especially for early stage investors, uh, looking at pre-seed seed stage. Um, if you look at historically, you know, the rule of thumb was, well, gee, you know, five to seven years, that, that's really not the case. As an early stage investor, you're looking at 10 years, right? And, and you, know, you, you know more about your, your, your children and sooner than, than you do about, about investing in startups, right? About how, how well they'll turn out. So um, it, it is a long-term game. And um, so you, you are looking at and really placing a bet, especially early stage on the founding team and, and uh, the market itself. And uh, you know, one thing that sometimes uh, causes me hesitation is um, more specifically as you're going through the pitch is if the, the founder or the founding team really doesn't understand the market. There are a lot of times when you get to the competition side and you have the two by two and, and that, that startup is, is that only one in that, that upper, left, uh, upper right quadrant, right? And we're the only one, we're first to market. You know, sometimes you see um, the companies doing pitches and then the investors are sitting there on their laptop Googling competition, right? And the number, you know, sometimes the top result is, is a com competitive company or a substitute company, right? So, so make sure you really deeply understand your market and, and what you're getting into. And be honest about it as well, right? I, I think honesty about competition, about your strengths and weaknesses is really important. And I would say <clears throat> the things that give us pause more often than not is around traction and like how far along the company is and whether or not to Eric's point, you know, <clears throat> how how much do we believe in this company or how competitive this company compared to not only the other companies in the space, but all the other companies I've seen over whatever given period of time. Like in a given month, I'll see 100 to 300 companies, right? So that means in a given quarter, I'll see 300 to 900 companies and I'll invest in zero to four, right? So if I see 900 companies, I make four investments, like clearly I'm going to say no far more than I'm going to say yes, right? And so that becomes difficult. But what I will say is the things that give us pause in the pitch immediately is if you're talking to us about a space and we start asking you questions about competitors and like there are competitors in the space that are fairly well known that you don't know of, that's going to give me pause, right? If we start asking you questions about your numbers and you don't know all your numbers or you don't know your unit economics, that's going to give me pause. If it feels like that you're you're tiptoeing around things and don't want to answer certain questions and you're trying to talk your way around it, like you're not going to be able to talk your way around our questions. Like we know what information we're looking for, right? So like, yes, you may be a great storyteller. Yes, you may be going on the right path. But if I ask you a direct question and you're trying to, you know, be like a politician to kind of talk around it, like I'm going to notice that. It's not going to be missed on us. Those kind of things give us pause. So when, so when you're pitching and you're going through the Q&A phase, you know, be honest, you know, answer the question. If you don't know the question, don't know the answer, it's okay to say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you, right? But those are those are very tactical things in a pitch that we're going to notice. Like if there's anything that you don't want us to know, you're probably going to ask about it. Don't try to hide it, right? Because a lot of stuff that founders try to hide very often aren't big deals, but they become a big deal because you try to hide it. Because if you try to hide something in the pitch, what are you going to hide when we have to have board meetings? What are you going to hide when your company starts to go through issues and, and you really need our help, right? Those are indications, those are little indicators that, you know, we look for. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, uh, Matt, you, you talked about the numbers, right? And this is more specifically for the CEO role, right? If you're the CEO, you better know your numbers inside and out. You better know your customers and know your product, right? Don't, you know, sometimes we come across CEOs who then defer to their CTO or, I mean, technically, technically she's fine, but ultimately on the top level, you need to understand what your product does, what your product vision is, who your customers are, why your customers behave, how they do and, and why they buy your product. And then know your unique economics and other financials inside and out. You have to know that as the CEO. 
So we talked a little bit about, you know, getting the yes, right, in order for someone to sign on. But what about if somebody has those moments of hesitation and they end up saying, you know what, this is not the right time for me. When is it okay for a founder to actually follow up with you, right? When does it become too nagging or too, you know, like, like here, hi, you know, here's my, my red flag, you know, I'm ready to go now. Um, when is it appropriate and not appropriate to follow up? Yeah, you know, this, this happens where, you know, I'll tell the founder not right now, get some more traction. They'll come back two weeks later. Like you probably haven't gotten enough traction in those two weeks. Now, if you have, sure. Like if you go from zero users to 20,000 users in two weeks, feel fine, reach out, out to me. But generally speaking, your follow-up's gonna be somewhere between six weeks to nine weeks, you know, give us some time to breathe, give us some time to, you know, cause in the meeting, we're gonna give you feedback. It's gonna take you some time to work through that feedback. Like you're not gonna work through that in a week. You're not gonna work through that in a month. Like it's gonna take you some time to get there. So kind of work on it. What I would say was more than like, more than likely to happen is you're gonna put us on like quarterly, or bi-monthly updates, add us to your update emails. Mm. And then when you have a significant change in the business or in the traction, then that's when it's a good time to reach out to me. Or if you have a specific question, like if you reach out to me the next week because you had a very specific question that I can answer, that's fine. But then don't ask me a specific question every week, right? You're trying to build a relationship, you're trying to build a cadence, but within reason. And so, you know, like it's okay to reach out. Just don't be a jerk about it. Yeah, I, I would say just maybe turning it in terms of just some recommendations for founders, right? I, I think you ideally when you talk to investors and investor isn't interested right now, uh, get a good understanding of what that investor is looking for, right? You know, the question is, do you fit within that potentially within that investor's portfolio in terms of their, their thesis and approach? If that's the case, great. Um, but you might not be ready at this point, right? The investor might be looking for, and again, investors have different criteria. I'll, I'll say maybe an investor is looking for 50,000 uh, MR, right? Or a you know, million dollars AR, whatever those factors are, try to find out as much as possible from the investor who says, no, not right now. Uh, and then if you can meet those numbers, let's say within six months or so, that's a great story to tell because you can go back to the investor and say, look, you said, this is what you're looking for. I've achieved that within that certain time frame that that I made a commitment to, right? And I think that's a good story to tell. Um, you know, ideally you don't, you know, and I think to be fair to founders, um, I think investors should not give a kind of a, you know, ambiguous answer in terms of maybe not right now, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what I'm looking for because some investors have the fear of missing out, right? I don't think that's fair. I think you should always give, you know, clear direction to those founders. Uh, so in, and if it's a hard no, it's a hard no, right? Say so. Uh, and if it's a it's a real it's if it's a good solid yes, then then let's talk about next steps at that point. One of the the last questions I had before I open it up to the group for for Q and A, um, investor decks. How important are they really <clears throat> in developing a persuasive pitch? So I've designed decks. I've created the the messaging behind them. I've worked with founders and you know adding all these little you know creative design touches to make sure that they look professional and on par, um, and even maybe just to show that they're a little bit bigger um, than what they actually are behind the scenes. But how important is the investor deck in your decision-making process? Mac, you'll go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Okay, so, so it is important. I, I think the deck is still one of the main documents that investors look for by default. I don't, you know, personally, I, I, I will use some other formats as well but I think you have to have a deck. Now that said, I think there are two types of decks or, or maybe three, right? There's, there's a teaser deck, which is basically a subset of your main pitch deck that you'll use. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, you've got to think through, a lot of times you see decks that are used for pitching that are really documents for reading, right? That have way too much text. So you also need to think about having a pitch deck, which is a deck that really supports your story, your, what you're verbalizing, right? And, and talking about. Uh, and um, being able to, you know, not to have to be too verbose on the slide because if you have too much text on the slide, what's going to happen is that the audience is going to start reading and not listening to you, right? So there's, you know, Olivia, you talked about designing the deck, right? I, I think the design in terms of structure and content and style is really important, 
Um, but uh, you also have to understand what the forum is and the, the type of audience you have for them to actually consume that information. That's a great point. All right, so I want to throw it for out me, to the group. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say investor decks are super important because you don't know what you don't know the process of the firm you're speaking with, right? Because at some venture firms, you're not going to get a chance to pitch to everybody. You're going to pitch to one person who's then going to take that information back to their team. And so they're going to be people on their team who are only <clears throat> going to know you based on whatever they regurgitate from you in your deck, right? And so if your deck doesn't clearly define what you do, well, you better hope whoever you pitch to can regurgitate everything you told them. But they're never going to know your business inside and out as much as you. So make sure you do have a deck that can be clear because you never know the process that a fund uses. It's a really great point. Um, so I'll open it up to the group for a Q&A. We had a couple of questions already come in. So one of the questions from Dalton I'm seeing, what are the best questions that a founder or CEO has asked you during a pitch? Well, look, I, whether it's during pitch or not, I, I think the important question is, and again, this is more guidance and advice to founders. Um, and, and this is even when I have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, right? Ask whether I'm interested in investing, right? Don't, don't be shy about it. Ask those investors. Uh, don't leave without having a clear answer. I, I think that's the best question that you can ask. Mm -hmm. and, and then two is, you know, I, I think that never leave without doing that, right? Um, but I think what's important too is it, it's a two-way street, right? You as the founder also need to understand um, and have chemistry with your investors, right? And you don't, you know, some occasionally you go just for the check, but that shouldn't be the default. That should be the exception, right? Um, usually you want investors who are strategic investors who can provide human capital and expertise in addition to the check. And you have to get along with them, right? This is a long-term relationship. So you have to ask those questions in terms of, you know, the way, how do they work with you as a startup once they invest, right? What kind of support are they providing? Um, what are their expectations, right? In terms of even tactical things like investor updates, right? And how do they work with you? What are their expectations three or five years from now? Um, you know, what other partnerships could they build with you? So I think understanding what that investor brings to the table is, is as important as for the investor to understand what the startup brings to the table for the investor. What about KPIs, right? We're looking at a lot of different KPIs in terms of uh, traction and metrics at an early stage. What are the most compelling metrics for you to see during a presentation? Again, it depends on the product or the, surface, the service in the, in the market, but what are some of the things that you're looking for in terms of numbers? It's all about, it's all industry and, and business model specific, but really we're looking for whatever KPIs <laughs> drive the bottom line. Right, whatever it is that drives the bottom line or shows a growth of the bottom line is what we're looking for, right? So like, we might not be looking for the amount of users, but it might be the amount of transactions you're having every month or how, how active your users are, how long are they spending on the product, right? Um, we wanna see like your order value, is it growing over time? Like it all depends on the business model, but it's like what indication, what indicators are there in your business model that shows growth? So like, let's say you have a marketplace and you have transactions, but every transaction is a different price. So even though you might do, you know, 20,000 in revenue the one month with two transactions, but you might do 10,000 revenue the next month with two transactions, right? In that case, I'm not going to be looking at revenue. I want to look at how you're growing your amount of transactions every month, right? Like that's going to be a better indicator, a better driver. So it all depends on the business or the, or the model, but being very clear on what are the KPIs that drive your bottom line. And if you're not clear on that, feel free to have that discussion with VCs and other mentors beforehand before you, as you're building your pitch, right? Like, that's a great question to reach out to me. Like, hey, Mac, you know, these are our key KPIs that we're working on. You know, is there anything I'm missing? And we might be able to have a, a back and forth email about that and even have a discussion before you even think to pitch me, right? Like, those are the kind of things you can look for. <clears throat> is it accurate to say yeah. that, those, that those KPIs would be different depending on a pilot program, for example, or validation within a customer segment? It could be, but it depends on how you structure it. It could be different or it could be the exact same. It really depends on how you set everything up. Yeah, um, I mean, everything that Max said in terms of it, it, it's business model specific, right? Um, but in terms of, you know, although you mentioned pilot, right? I think other than specific KPIs, a great thing to see and what you don't see a lot is when companies are actually able to convince their customers 
to have paid titles or paid tests, right? Or to prepay for their product, or as opposed to giving away product for free for the first six or 12 months, they're actually able to compel their customers to start paying very soon and start turning that, that revenue lever on sooner rather than later. Uh, so that's a really compelling, compelling case a lot of times. And, and you know, you might see that one times out of 10, but when, when you start saying, hey, I've got paid pilots and they're actually funding product development, that's a great story to tell. Uh, this is more in terms of, you know, setting the stage for uh, being polite uh, in your emails. I'm sure you have some founders that keep picking, pinging you via email. Um, and there might be some founders that you don't respond to um, because at some point you're like, okay, enough is enough. Uh, but how appropriate it, is it for a founder to kind of ping you if they think that they're getting lost in your inbox? Yeah, I, I think, it, I mean, it's... It, it. You've got to, um, like any communi human communication, you, you've got to understand the person on the opposite end, right? Understand their, I guess, their, their behavior and their, their culture as well. And, and but sometimes that, that's hard to do. I, I think it's a balance between, between being persistent and at the same time understanding when, when it, it's a no, right? Um, and, and, you know, in terms of being persistent, I think sometimes investors also look for you to be persistent because it shows that you have a knack for selling, right? But again, like, like an annoying salesperson, right? D don't be annoying and be overbearing either, right? Understand when um, the signal is there that uh, you should back off or, or the, the, the answer is no. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's always important for both sides to be polite and professional, right? I try to answer all my emails. Uh, sometimes, you know, frankly, emails get lost, right? In the the, the still be emails that investors get. So, I think following up a few times um, that that's that's good to do. And hey, I'm bumping this up on your on your inbox. Just want to make sure you saw it, right? And I think uh, uh, it, it's a fair ask for uh, for a startup or a founder to ask the investor to at least reply, right? In my mind. So, you know, I'm somebody who's very public and open with my persona and with people being able to reach out to me. Because of that, I get way more um, communications a day than I could ever respond to, right? So I would tell you, be persistent, keep pinging me. The one thing you don't do, don't send me a message and say, uh, forget you, Mac. You know, you never responded to my email or you never responded to my DM. You're not real or you fake or you don't care about entrepreneurs. Do you think trying to shame me is gonna make me wanna invest in you? Probably not, right? Do not put a message on Twitter and be like, I reached out to Mac 10 times, he never responded. Well, I don't follow you. I didn't see your DMs. It's only so much time in the day. I'm sorry. But now that you put that on Twitter, good for you. Probably not invested, right? Like there are ways for you to still continue to try to reach out to me without you trying to shame me for not responding to an email that within the 24 hour day that's only so much time I have and I have a family and other obligations to do, right? Like this job is in my life, even though for a lot of VCs, it can become that, right? But being polite will get you a lot further than you trying to shame somebody. Cause like, I'm going to miss on a lot of companies. I'm only going to be able to invest in a few, right? Like I'm not, I'm not going to be great. I'm not going to be perfect, but we can't even start to have a dialogue the moment you do something like that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, one other thing, right, and I think it's important distinction to draw here is know your audience, right? There, there's definitely a difference between venture capitalists and the angel investors, right? I mean, VCs, I think, you know, I'm not going to speak for you, Mac, but I think in general, right, VCs, that, that's their job, right? A VC may be spending 40 to 60% of the time on sourcing deals, right? And the other time, obviously, raising money for their own fund and doing other things. Uh, angel investors, you know, the typical angel investor is a high net worth individual, right? Maybe a doctor or a lawyer, they've got day jobs, right? So you've got to understand that as well. It's not their full-time job to, uh, to source deals. Um, I think most angel investors are very generous with their time, uh, but respect that time too, right? When you get it. Uh, one of the things that I always think about is um, there's always an, an aha pivot in a pitch, right? There's something that a founder says and you're like, you know, that was, that was what I was looking for. For me personally, it's seeing if a founder has done research in terms of things or other companies, portfolio companies, for example, that they might be able to uh, become complimentary um, sponsors of, um, you know, to make sure that, that uh, 
it's more in line in terms of what you're looking for for your portfolio uh, progression. So what's kind of that aha? Is there something that you're looking for that a founder will say or do um, to make that really good last impression for you? So this is easy, right? If your traction number is big enough, none of the other stuff matters, right? Like, does the pitch matter? Yeah. The business matters far more, right? Like, the best investments I've ever made were in companies that were just growing so incredibly well that it was like, yeah, I want to be a part of this, right? Where, where like, there were like, if they never pitched me, I probably still might have jumped head in, right? So like, yeah, the pitch is important, but you having a good, solid, successful business is far more important. Like that's the goal. We're investing because we believe that you can grow that company. So if you come into the room like, look, my name is X Y Z. This is the problem we're solving. This is our solution. Over the last six months, we've grown by 38% month over month. Four months ago, we did 40,000 in sales. This month, we did 128,000 in sales, right? Like, I literally know a founder that had a pitch that was similar to that who raised 1.5 million in 24 hours, right? Like, at the end of the day, if you have a good company, you can get there. So if you, so like, if you can hit me over the head with something like that, we're good. <laughs> It's funny you say that, Mac. I actually had a conversation earlier today with the company. And uh, so, so we had a half an hour conversation, right? And we talked to the business for about 20 minutes. And in about between a minute and 20, 25, we started talking about revenue and, and traction. And uh, the answer was, well, in, in 2019, we ended the year with about 75,000 ARR. Uh, last year, we ended up with about a million dollars. You know, in December, a few months ago, right? Million dollars ARR. And we're expecting to do about two to three million by the end of this year. You know, I mean, if you hear numbers like that, you're like, okay, I'm pretty much sold there, right? Let's let's talk more. So, you know, the traction that that company has was pretty amazing. Uh, in addition to the investors that they uh, were able to get over the past few months, and then also the, the the partnerships that they were building. So, it was a clear cut case. Like, if I could write a check today, I would, right? So, so yeah, traction is 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 one of those big things that you look for. Great. Um, is there any last thoughts that you want to leave to to our group of participants um, before we close out for the evening? Any last thoughts? I think the big one is rem always remember, like fundraising is not the goal, right? Like we as VCs get overhyped all the time because founders think that if you give me VC and they write you a check, all your dreams will come true. That's, that's not what this is, right? What we do is we give you a tool to help you grow faster. That's all the money is. It's rocket fuel to grow faster, right? At the end of the day, you're out here to build the best company you possibly can. And that should always be the goal. And as long as that's your driving goal, you're on the right track. Yeah, and, and I would say, um, understand that uh, dilutive venture capital money is not the only avenue to build a good company and to grow, right? Um, you know, I, I think a lot of founders think that's the only, only, you know, only thing that, that's available, right? There, there are other avenues. There are plenty of good, solid companies that were bootstrapped or maybe have gotten some friends and family and early angel investors that have grown very well that have never had to go down the venture capital road. Uh, if let's say you're a SaaS company and, and you start producing profit, uh, you can look at revenue-based financing. If let's say you're even uh, a company that is, let's see in the two to $3 million range, uh, you can look at venture debt. That's another option. And sometimes you combine venture debt with venture capital, um, dilutive capital as well. So there are a lot of options out there, right? So make sure that you really understand uh, philosophically what kind of company you want to build long-term. Uh, and I think that impacts your culture as well. Uh, and then what options are available to you? And then ultimately, what's your funding strategy? And, and like Max said, you know, the goal is to build a good, healthy company that's there for the long term and not to raise money. Money is only a tool in your toolbox. Awesome. Well, thank you so much um, to both of you for joining us this evening. Um, I saw a couple of questions in terms of the recording and the PowerPoint. The recording will be available um, through Prepare for VC. The PowerPoint will be accessible. Um, I'll be posting it on my personal website, oliviacuntica.com, for you to, uh, to be able to access it. Um, and if anybody wants to reach out to you guys, um, what's the best way? You can find me on Twitter, it's at Matt Conwell. I put it in the chat earlier, it's at with my name that you can see here on the chat and the, on the screen. Find me on Twitter, find me on Clubhouse, best way to get to me. Okay, 
and, and for me, I, I, I'm not much of a tweeter. Do that on occasion, but best way to reach out, is just connect with you on LinkedIn. Great. Uh, and Jason, thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Right. Yeah, thank you. And what's the best, Olivia, what's the best way uh, to connect with you? Um, if you find me in the digital web, I will likely respond, uh, Twitter, or uh, you'll find all of my information on my website. Sounds good. Yeah, no, great discussion, everyone. Um, and yeah, thanks to all of our audience members. Great, great questions. And um, yeah, great, you know, great chat going on here as well. So excited. Uh, Excited for more of these. Definitely check out um, some of the upcoming events on our community page, and feel free to reach out if there's anything else um, you know we can help you in your in your current startups. All Thanks right. again. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you.